Hello, and welcome to the 13th uh, edition of Techno Crime Fighters Forum. My name is Paul Marco, and with us today are our normal panel. Uh, without Millicent, Millicent has had an appointment and can't be with us today. So we have with us Dr. Horton, uh, Karen Milton Stewart, and I'm sure Romola will come on board uh, soon. So uh, the topic today is going to be shielding, and then we're going to delve into the topic of military. Since military, this is a military program, uh, we're going to have a lot to talk about on that. But we have a lot of requests to go over shielding things for people out in our audience that are TIs and need to buy certain type of things uh, for shielding. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to uh, Catherine and Karen. Uh, Catherine said that, Karen, you might be a good one to start off on shielding since you're okay. sitting in a shielded kind of environment right now. So uh, yes. uh, I'm going to turn it over to Actually, actually whilst you start off, Karen, I'm going to bring as a demonstration to show people the things that you got me as shielding, you know, the green things. So whilst you get started and I'll, I'll bring them for, to show people. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. Um, first, first of uh, all, what I tell people is I'm not a scientist, you know, I'm basically what somebody called a word nerd. So that means very much right brain and not a lot left brain, but uh, through trial and error have, uh, I also started out with aluminum and found that if you use aluminum, you have to use multiple layers of it, you know, seven to 12 to be effective. And that's something, if you find yourself being hit immediately, that's something to grab, but you're probably gonna want to augment that with other things. And uh, what I tell people is, look, whatever you're getting hit with, you have a problem with heat. Even the ultrasonics, when an ultrasonic wave, which, you know, if you, if you view ultrasonics as a wave, the higher and the more intensive the wave is, I mean, the ultrasonics are, the more closely together the wave shows on any what is this, spectom, uh, spectrograph or spectrometer or something like that. Um, but if you have ultrasonics of a certain level, those waves become solid bands, and those solid bands generate heat just like microwave, just like electromagnetic radiation, um, all, all of what we're facing generates heat, and that is what they're trying to kill us with, you know? So what you want to think about is what is heat reflective, heat resistant, and also some of this will uh, reflect with mirrored uh, surfaces, you know, like aluminum, like mylar, M-Y-L-A-R, and also I found useful the window tinting and car tinting that is sold to people who have automobiles and cars in the hotter states, you know, like Texas, Florida, Georgia, where they have, where these tints are sold with a very high heat resistance and uh, reflectivity actually get a roll of window tinting for your car or for your house and just put it on the wall thing on the wall and cover the window as well uh, you can use the blue tape that is for painting that will not destroy your paint job so that's one aspect um, and I've used that in my car I got uh, for my car I got the high heat resistant window tinting that you can put on with water so that as at a certain point you don't like it you just take it off it's not a big deal as where the uh, self adhesive is pretty complex to put on um, and we'll go into the what I did with my car as well but Again, you're thinking heat resistance and some reflectivity. Now, you can put in your home strong magnets, put them all over the place, put, strong, put mirrors that face toward the outside of the house. And that actually has screwed up V2K that they've tried to use on me. I've heard voices or sounds out into the room, but not in my head. So that tells me what they're using for V2K is linear. And once it hits the room with the strong magnets and the mirrors, it gets thrown all over the place and they can't aim it at me. So they have royally failed in that, in those probably about five attempts. Uh, one attempt was uh, when I was walking the dog and I was wearing a baseball cap that had 
Silver Infusion, which I will plug the people who uh, who make those. You know, I think it's uh, electromagnetic field, less EMF. So take a look at anything with silver infusion because that seems to work very nicely. And they even have sleeping caps with silver infusion and eye masks with silver infusion. So them I recommend very much. And the baseball cap you see me wearing very often, not today, but very often is silver infused. I live in it, not because I love baseball caps, but because it actually works. So um, again, we're going to go back to the general shielding. Uh, Ramola gave me the tip about reflectix. Okay, Reflectix is something that uh, is like bubble wrap, but with aluminum on both sides. So that is very nice in that it stands by itself. Mm -hmm. it's, it's rather stiff, but still malleable. And it comes in about three different widths in heights. So that helps a lot. I will tell you that anything with Teflon, like a baking sheet, that will reflect a great majority of these weapons. Now, nothing is foolproof but we're working into protecting yourself as much as possible if you get down to 80 90 percent deflection of this stuff you're doing pretty well so um i have even resorted at times to sleeping in a cast iron bathtub with a lot of this uh, shielding over me because that gives me pretty darn good protection i've used cast iron grills uh, again, you can get grill sheets, and this is a wonderful time of year to go out looking for this stuff because we're heading into summer, and they're going to be selling grill sheets, which is the uh, sheet you put on the grill where you cook vegetables so they don't fall through the, um, the, the grill, the coal. So you want grill sheets that are up to 500 degrees heat resistant. Um, those can be taped to a wall. Those can be taped inside your car. Okay, another good thing, I have found that copper uh, is actually better than aluminum, uh, whether it's aluminum foil or aluminum piece of metal, because copper actually deflects a broader range of these waves than aluminum. Okay, now I will tell you that when I was getting tailed and shot from behind, I put aluminum uh, metal pieces in the hatchback of my SUV. I put them, I taped them up against the back of the hatchback. And when these idiots came up behind me thinking they were so smart, they had caught me at a red light or a stop sign. And they came up to me and uh, an inch from my bumper with the directed energy weapon on full force. Well, guess what? I saw them doing their little dance in their car because the copper was reflecting it right back into their car and they couldn't do anything about it. And they were stuck where they were because there were, there were people behind them. So that was rather gratifying, but um, you can take the, these um, copper sheets in the back of your car and they come in different sizes. I put the biggest that I could find and it will reflect this garbage back into the cars of the people hitting you with it. And I guarantee you, they won't come as close. If you want to add oomph to that, you can actually take something called grill paint that is, is heat resistant grill paint that is made so that you can repaint your grill once it starts to wear, you know, and you need the heat resistant. And there are two different types. One of them you get at Lowe's, one of them you get at Home Depot. I think Home Depot goes up to about 11, 1200 degrees heat resistant. But if you go to Lowe's, it's about 2000 degrees heat resistant. The most effective thing is to have the copper that faces towards the perps, and then you put the heat resistant paint on the side of the copper that is inside your car so that anything that actually penetrates the copper is mitigated by the grill resistant heat paint. You can fix up your car with that. There are even like hobby shops that will sell you a uh, piece of copper, very shiny copper for hobbies, but you can find one that fits more or less the size of your visor. So I suggest putting these copper sheets um, that are about the size of your visor on the outside where the visor is looking toward the, the oncoming traffic and pull it down so that these people shoot you with anything, it gets deflected and you don't get so much blinded by it. You know, obviously you, and, and you can also buy um, laser goggles while you're driving so that some of these people who have the lasers actually in their lights coming towards you 
you and won't eventually make you blind. So that's an, another suggestion. I don't know. If we can show the list, it might prompt my memory. But also something else to think about is um, electrical tape. That is heat resistant. That's yet another tip. But like I said, it's just, you know, Teflon is wonderful. It really is. The grill, re uh, the heat resistant grill paint, the copper, I think are all the best. Now, um, don't forget these. Um, when, once you get to the vibrational uh, weapons or, 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 pardon? I said, don't forget these carrots. There you go, silicon. Exactly. So I was going to say, mm -hmm. as soon as. Yes, I, I sent Dr. Horton a couple of silicon oven mitts. Um, when you get to vibrational weapons and ultrasonic high-pitched hearing, uh, you're looking at being able to mitigate the vibrations of these things, and copper and, and such don't really do it. What you need is something like silicon. Silicon is like rubber. It will dampen and reduce the vibration of these things. And so it is heat resistant. So it also is, uh, like I said, it's malleable. So you can actually put it in your clothing. And what I sent Catherine um, are the Rachel Ray oven mitts. And don't get the ones with the thumbs, get the rounded ones um, that you can find at Walmart. And so they've got a cloth side that you can wear against your skin. And then you, put, you point the silicon outward toward the weapons. Don't put the silicon next to your skin. You will erupt with open sores because uh, silicon does not allow your skin to breathe. So you're going to need something in between the silicon and your skin if you put it in your clothing. I mean, you can sew these things into a vest and wear it. You can put them under your clothing however you... Um, but you are looking to mitigate vibrational and, uh, and ultra-high pitch noise uh, with silicon. I'll tell you that if it's vibrational, what it does is it makes your body resonate to the vibration being sent into your home or at you. And that is extraordinarily dangerous because if your heart vibrates at a rate it's not meant to, it'll stop. Or your kidneys will be destroyed or something of that nature. So you have got to protect yourself from that type of thing. If you are lucky enough to be hearing a high-pitched sound, then you know that it's there and it's affecting you. So do please take some kind of precautions because this will kill you. Um, I spoke to David Galbots, who is a military um, officer, or he was, he's retired now, and he was telling me that on one of the uh, army bases that he worked, they would actually truck in dogs that he had apparently stolen or gotten from the humane sh shelter under false pretenses and test these weapons on them. And ultrasonics, coughing, that means you are at the beginning of uh, respiratory arrest. Do something to protect yourself. Even if it's high-pitched noise, it can be killing you. So, um, like I said, the, we will have the list, I think, uh, hopefully for anybody, everybody to see. And uh, if you have any ideas, by all means, please uh, get in touch with us and we will discuss that. Things that I've, um, in the last 19 or 20 months of being targeted, like I said, I'm not a scientist. And unfortunately, Dr. Duncan has said he can't give people tips on how to shield because it would betray his confidentiality oath. But since I never worked on anything like this, my own um, uh, trial and error is not in the least confidential. I am absolutely more than glad to share these insights with people. And if it triggers you to tell us more uh, products that you find useful, please, by all means, because what we want to do is save a life. And by golly, we want everybody alive and healthy when we get our day in court and these people go to prison. Yeah, I think you know, um, actually on this note, then protect yourselves. yourselves. All right, so that's, that's my feel right now. So sorry, Karen, I actually interrupted on my end. It was it was delayed, but um, I I. Um, I this, this is such a, a great list, actually. The, the things that I can add to that, 
So um, I'm not sure if my camera is actually showing, um, you know, my end. Uh, maybe yes, I see you. You can see me um, blown up. Okay, because um, so I just want to show people my shoes. I have to insulate my study like that all around because I have perps all around like this. And there's aluminium behind the case. Um, so my study, which looks like normal office usually, looks like um, a bunker for the 21st century war. And I have to say, I'm glad I did that. It's not perfect because I still can be, and I am being shot at from above and from below. I'm sitting on, um, on a carpet which has, I think, six layers of aluminium below. Um, but what I can hear is the shots against the aluminium that are fired from my neighbors. And it is just astounding. Every now and then I'll just hear an actual loud popping sound as these military shots are being fired. And in the last episode, I actually showed a video where I recorded not just the audio of these shots, but you can actually see a shot putting a dent into aluminium. I mean, we are talking horrific, horrific military weapons here. Um, but already aluminium helps a lot with these directed shots because they get just reflected back. Um, and I agree with Karen that copper is, is so much better, but I think it's also, I think, five to ten times more expensive. So if you really have to cover a room, you know, you can always buy a baking foil or aluminium foil um, and just cover the room for, you know, less than $20, whereas with copper, I think that would be $200 or something like that. Um, yeah. So the problem is, though, you need so very much aluminum, multiple layers. So people, when you're putting up aluminum, one layer is not going to do it. Minimum seven, and I've heard people say 12 is better. Yeah, that's true. So I have got, um, I don't have them here, but in my videos, I show them these big panels, and they are moving boxes, which I have wrapped um, six times over in aluminum. So that there's actually six layers either side of the cardboard. And when I go to bed, I make a tent. So I put, you know, aluminum these aluminium panels under the mattress and then aluminium panels above like that. And I literally crawl into the tent. And that's how I slept for the past, I think, eight months or something like that. And I tried putting a Faraday cage around that, but I have to say a Faraday cage does very, very little. I think there might be some signals that are popping out, but otherwise the directed shots, they just punch through like nothing mm -hmm. else. That's, a, that's my experience. And I have a... I'm sorry, I, I end up using cookie sheets, you know, the Teflon that Karen was talking about. Um, I literally line on, well, I'm sleeping on the couch these days, you know, sometimes I sleep upstairs, which is in this room on my bed, uh, but they hit very nicely from downstairs. So I've started to sleep on the couch and they seem to have less downstairs, that is, and they seem to be able to hit me less over there. But literally I have to line the couch on one side, you know, with these cookie sheets wrapped in reflectics, which, you know, also Karen was talking about, now I'm surrounded by reflectics. I can show you what it looks like. Uh, it's just it's just like the aluminium foil you're talking about, Karen. It's just a little thicker because it has a bubble wrap on the inside. And this, you can definitely hear the shots, as you were saying, pulsed microwave shots from absolute military weapons, you know. And they, ha they have such utter gall because they are making such a racket. And we can record this racket, you know. And I have started to record it. But I've slept so many nights without recording it, and they make incredibly loud sounds. And they wake you up several times through the night. This is all part of their sleep deprivation mechanism, you know, um, total torture. Imagine, we're talking about modern day Europe and America. We're being tortured. This is torture. Yeah, Classic I think sleep deprivation torture. Well, mm -hmm. Let me, let me jump in and give a hint for people who are, I mean, the most important time that you're shielded is when you sleep. I want to interrupt not only your sleep to make you tired and uh, keep you uh, confused, but they also want to interrupt the healing that your cellular, um, that you do overnight. So one thing that I found, um, if you are can actually conduct some of this, and then also if you can put under your bed mirrors that reflect down, you want the shiny side to reflect down because, because some of these weapons will actually come up through the ground. Even if you don't have a basement, I have, uh, been woken up by absolute vibration coming up through the ground on a slab 
So the way that I fixed that was to put mirrors facing downward under the bed and to also put multiple uh, layers of aluminum in between the box spring and the mattress. And I will tell you another thing that I didn't mention. Um, there's something called a dog cooling gel bed. Again, it's on sale now because it's, it's summer. And that has cooling gel in it that does feel cool to the touch, but it will mitigate vibrations and sound-based weapons. So that is yet another thing you could actually add to your repertoire and put on your bed and sleep on it if you have problems with anything coming up through the bed and you can actually sleep on one and then put another one on top of you. They have small, medium, large, extra large. So you decide what it is that you want to, to do, you know, uh, the configuration that you want. And I would go to the cheaper stores, um, you know, like, uh, you know, some of these uh, secondhand stores that they just basically sell things other places could not get rid of. And you'll get a $24 dog cool jet, uh, bell, uh, gel bed for 16 when it's originally 25 So that helps a lot. Um, so that's yet another idea I wanted to make sure that I did not forget to mention. Yeah, I think... Um, um you know the, the other thing I, I um, actually before I before I forget um, or maybe we should we should stick up the, um, the military section. Yeah, actually maybe we should. I, I just have to remember that comment about Dr. Robert Duncan um, and his reticence to inform us about shielding. Anyway, um, you know the, the other thing which is is so important and people forget about that because you you um, we now covered shielding against um, ultrasonics and shielding against electromagnetic um, things. Um, and also, IMA works just like the reflective, reflectix. It's um, it's the aluminium sheeting and so on. But the other thing um, you also have to shield against is when you're staying in a hotel, break in. Because they will leave you in the hotel room and in you. And um, you have to lock the room, you have to lock the entrance, and you have to make sure that if there's a desk, you actually push the desk and jam the desk against the, the door because otherwise these at night. It's one of the standard things. So it's even that sort of thing you have to think about. And you know, I, I just want to pop in one little interjection there when you speak about hotels and breaking in, Catherine, is um, one of the things you can use, by the way, is a door stopper. You know, you can stick that underneath your door as well. There, there are door stopper alarms meant for people who stay in hotels a lot. Oh, brilliant. That that sounds like a great thing, too. So there's an alarm as well. So there's a sound that'll go off. Yeah, yeah. But, on the door, yes. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to actually underline at this point, and maybe this is a tiny little segue into the military aspect, is when we say people are breaking into hotel rooms and they're breaking into homes, I want to underline that these are activities, these are covert activities that are actually being conducted by special operations forces and by clandestine services. And if you look up the military manuals, you know, if you look up um, and the CIA manuals, you will learn about the clandestine services. You're not going to learn about everything they do, but this is the kind of thing that you have to read the, you know, the investigative journalism on the CIA to find out about. So clandestine action and covert action is not, you know, figments of imagination in this day and age anymore. It's not paranoia. It's not a bunch of people getting paranoid about what the surveillance state is doing. It's actual um, strategic operating procedure from the military, from the very dark operations in, in, in our military services and in our intelligence services, which really are not our military and our intelligence anymore. They're working for somebody else, clearly, you know. They're working for the corporate state Next. against people. Sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead, Catherine. How very, 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 very important it is that you are you lock yourself in in hotel rooms at all times. Um, I just actually experienced last week because, as I mentioned last week, I had to flee to a hotel room and, um, you know, I, I came back um, on the weekend. And I'm not sure if it happened in that hotel room or if it happened here in my private home. But the other thing is that I also discovered um, a fresh surgical scar on my belly button 
So after having put out n number of cease and des desist requests to Marcus Seiler in Switzerland, these psychopathic nutters literally cannot be stopped. They just continue with the program, they continue with their mutilation, and there's nothing we can do. So, you know, I just discovered this scar it randomly when they set off the chip that was inside and suddenly I had this intense burning. And since then, they have been using that as part of the harassment schedule. And when I spoke to Melanie Richan, her first reaction was immediately, oh yes, yes, I know, I have got a scar on my belly button too. It's one of the places they implant. So, oh yeah, and, and this scar is new. So I, like Melanie, every single time she woke up with scars, she had to go to the doctor, have it certified, you know, um, and then you just see, is, is nanotech going to grow out? Because what Melanie had is that afterwards she had these black fibers, what are they called, black silicon or whatever they are, grow out of these surgical scars that Belgian intelligence put on her. So, you know, it's a, it's a total nightmare because what these psychopaths are doing now is, is conducting these experiments with synthetic, synthetic materials, with chipping, and also with organically modified things that then grow inside you. So we are talking the, the worst Nazi nightmare you can possibly imagine. And Catherine, did this happen recently in your apartment? Yes, it's, it's either in my apartment or in this hotel room. I can't quite, quite date the surgical scar because... They, well, they probably, they probably used a laser to, to close it up. Yeah, it looks like it. It really looks like it because the scar is really fine. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of sealed up. It's not perfectly sealed up, but you can see that there's, a, you know, an actual scar. Um, but it's just unbelievable, you know, and then you know there's a chip inside because they use it as part of the harassment routine. You know how they have the schedule that they want to, you know, prod you or, or give you pain every 10 seconds, every three seconds. And then they will switch from one side of the body to the next, from the top to the bottom and just harass you. And then suddenly they integrate this into their harassment schedule. So, um, but yes. I, I have been implanted on the soles of my feet with what appears to be something like a curled wire and, uh, and another little implant, and both of them are radio frequency emitting and receiving because I know when they're being activated, and they're being activated literally by my neighbor, you know, wielding weapons, you know, tracking and sensing devices and pointing them at me. So, um, Literally, I can feel it when they're being activated. So they're being used as well for tracking, you know, and That's also all those pain signals, pain activation signals. It's so interesting that you would say that because one of the things that I notice is that every single time I go into a hotel room, I get attacked horrifically. So, um, you know, I went to a victim meeting in Rotterdam and that was the first time they, they actually flashed images into my head and use some sort of interrogation because I suddenly woke up, you know, when I had just intense, like really clear images in my head. And that seemed to be, I woke up and I realized that I had been just talking really fast to myself in a fashion that was utterly not, I mean, not out loud, but in my mind. And then eventually they flashed the scene and made me wake up with a pulse. Um, so that happened, but they seem to have these little demonstrations every time you go into a hotel room. And I suspect it's because in a hotel room, the walls are very thin. So they really get to your head, you know, they just have to be on the other side of the wall. And um, what they did with me last week is that uh, they, they, oh, sorry, the window's open, so maybe you can hear the aluminium. But, um, you know, they, they woke me up in the middle of the night and, and that's their habit. So they either pulse your head or they make your, you know, your, your scalp burn or something. So you, you wake up. And then what they did is that they hit me so that immediately I felt this need I have to get up. You know, and you're not even conscious and you just have to get up. And I don't know how they did that because I only really woke up when I was already, you know, climbing out of bed and standing up. And then as soon as I put my foot down, one of the soles of my feet, exactly as you described, was just burning and tingling. But it wasn't like my, you know, my leg had pins and needles because it was just a small area on, the, on my foot. So I thought they must have been irradiating me. Or maybe I have an implant in the soles of my feet as well. But literally, I climbed out of bed, and, and what really woke me up was the fact that I couldn't stand on one foot because it was agonizingly painful. And you think, this is Marcus Seiler's Nazi, you know, mental people doing it here in Zurich. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I don't understand why they think they can get away with it, but it appears to me from looking at some of the, the, the literature on the subject, you know, for instance, Charles Schlund's affidavit, which is very, very important for everyone to read. It's on Arlene Johnson's uh, truedemocracy.net website, and I reposted it on my website, you know, a little while ago. But basically, this is somebody who uncovered a great deal of... Um, uh, misbehavior from the CIA 20 to 30 years ago and basically the CIA had um, at the end in the uh, 80s and 90s had been trying to hide a lot of documentation and and he came upon this documentation and started writing about it but what and one of the things that happened to him was he was implanted you know and he was heavily tortured all through the course of his life the latter part of his life um, with these implants you know with the implant activation and the pain signaling and he sued the CIA, he sued George Bush, and his lawsuits can be found online. And everything that he details in his affidavit can be found online. Um, but one of the things that he mentioned was that um, apparently these, uh, these agencies seem to think that if they implant somebody, then that person, in, the, in, in a sense, that, that's like a government implant or whatever. And if that gets into, inside the bodies of these people who are being surveilled, then it's kind of kosher. You know, in other words, it's kind of okay from a certain point of view, from a legalistic point of view, that they... Property. Property, yeah, that they're, it's their property. Can you believe that? I mean, I, I can't even wrap my brain around that thinking. I think, I think that the key thing to realize is that these people are utterly mentally demented. They, their brain is properly gone. So what you actually see, and that's also classic psychopaths, it's this kind of like playground, you know, um, sort of logic. You know, it's like, oh, I tell you, now you're mine sort of stuff. You know, it's total, total bullshit. But these people's brains function, I think, at the operational level of a five-year-old. So, you know, the CIA... Oh turning out these, these miscellaneous directors just talking to themselves, thinking that if they just write something down on paper, they can to them. And um, it's really just a sign of psychopathy, of utter psychopathy, and the fact that um, they hire people around themselves who are, in some cases, like, what's his name, Chris Dorsey, standard of stupid. Really. <laughs> That's pretty stupid. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, you know, Good it's question. sad, but the intelligence communities have legal departments where they say, okay, here's the new law. What can we get from it? And very clearly, they've run with a viciously, uh, obviously, illogical interpretation of so many laws because what they're doing is that they're going to say oh we're going to pretend that we misunderstand then when they catch us if they catch us then we're going to go oh our mistake we're so sorry we totally misunderstood what you said well this goes to the principle of it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission and that's what they're operating on because nobody in his or her right mind can interpret these laws to be unconstitutional, you know, and have unconstitutional purposes and, uh, and then proceed on criminal behavior to say, oh, but the law said we could. Yeah, but the Constitution should have told you that this, your interpretation of the law was wild. It's just not acceptable. But they, it's a sleight of hand. They know what they're doing. I mean, mm -hmm. I was told by one woman I worked with uh, at NSA who spent years uh, getting her, her law degree, and then she transferred from an intelligence analyst into working for the um, legal department at NSA. And within a year, she was quitting. And I said, well, what are you doing quitting after, her name was Laura, and what are you doing after spending so many years trying to get to where you wanted to be? You got there, and then now you're quitting, you know, or now you're transferring somewhere else. And she said, Karen, if somebody in the inside of NSA sues them, like for a labor dispute or some kind of problem, they declare them a terrorist, and then they eavesdrop on their conversations with their lawyer in order to get advantage in the lawsuit. She said, I can't do that. You know, and so I said, well, I don't blame you. I had no idea. So that's the kind of games they are playing. 
that's bombshell, Karen, that, that, you know, somebody in the NSA actually said that, said that the NSA is doing this. The NSA is naming people terrorists anytime they want for any spurious reason and going after them. And the you know, FISA courts and the FBI are, yeah, the FBI and the FISA courts are just rubber stamping this. Yeah, and I understand the FISA courts can't actually refuse the NSA or whoever steps forward and says we need a warrant, right? I think they could question it, but they don't. They don't, yeah, because there was an article, somebody wrote something about they, they don't deny any request for a warrant, whether it's from the FBI or the NSA or whoever. I don't even know who would go and ask them. Well, I think that things are written up with certain keywords, and then that triggers the, the FISA courts to pass them. But they're not checking on the validity of what, what the accusations are. Mm -hmm. You know, suing NSA because they didn't promote you because you're black, you know, so mm -hmm. it, it's just outrageous. It really is outrageous. I mean, some of those things started coming out before they attacked me. So I was very wary of NSA security. Um, wrong there for quite some time. You know, it's just that you don't run into it overtly mm -hmm. unless you cross their path and you actually report something wrong, you know. Mm -hmm. And I know from your case in particular, it's NSA security inside NSA that was particularly troublesome in this regard, right? Uh, yes. Well, um, I was speaking to Russell Tice over lunch a few years back, and he said, look, when General Hayden came in, uh, his job, and we knew his job, was uh, to eviscerate NSA. Because in the 1990s, the Congress decided, well, with no Iron Curtain, we have no enemies anywhere anymore, so we need to eviscerate the military and the intelligence communities. So when General Hayden came in, he promoted a man named L. Kemp Enzer III from um, middle management and security to be the head of operational. And I've had several people claim that this man is himself a psychopath actions that NSA security took against me, I'm inclined to believe that and have that as an opinion as well. I also was told that he loves uh, actions of Dante's Inferno because he considers himself to be um, basically ruling in hell. Uh, so he's from all accounts, he's not a well men, a mentally well person. And this is who you have driving NSA operationally. He's not a CEO. He's not a you know executive. But he is an operational pit bull that goes after anybody that somebody in, of any importance says. The One of the women I knew was railroaded out of NSA because she dated the wrong man. She was dating the, uh, the son of someone who knew an NSA executive. The woman did not like her, did not want her to marry her son, was afraid they were getting too serious. So she told her executive friend at NSA basically to destroy this woman. And this ex executive friend went to security and said, destroy her. And they did. They gave her a mental breakdown from the stalking harassment and viciousness of the on-the-job harassment and the rumors about her. Uh, she had a mental breakdown and then, uh, went, well, I, I would say an emotional breakdown. And then NSA said, oh, you're not fit to work here because you hold the you're not stable, we're firing you. And she was mid-career, so she got nothing from working at NSA. She got no retirement, no benefits, nothing. And that is so incredibly petty, you know, just absolutely insanely petty that they would do that. But that's what they do. Yeah, it's actually, it's, I would say it's not just petty. It is, it is actually outright criminal. It is actually criminal. And um, it's so interesting. It's malicious. Mm, yes, yes. And, um, you know, it's interesting to hear that because this is an aspect that I, I haven't heard before, but it, it seems to tie in with the entire deep capture of NSA, you know, that, that sneaked in through NSA security and also via um, a Hayden, you know, um, and, um, and, and also uh, Bill Binney is on public record saying that, you know, it was a fine place to work until Michael Hayden came and then it went downhill rapidly, you know. But that guy seems to be at the heart of the deep capture. He's 
to be, you know, who seem to have been planted there by, by the organized crime cartel to take down NSA and utterly corrupt it, and it from the inside. Um, and I think, I suspect something very similar has happened in tandem with all other intelligence agencies as well over the, over the recent past. Um, because you, you never, I mean, NSA is pretty big, it's, it's a big hub, but um, I would suspect that we have to watch out for something similar having occurred at every other intelligence agency because it's a program. And you know, Catherine, at this point also, I think we should also talk about how um, all of these security and intelligence agencies have really been taken over by the people who are running this envo, you know, and there's, there's a huge aspect of Satanism associated with it. And in fact, I wanted to ask Karen if this, if this person, Kemp Ensor, was a stated Satanist, like, uh, what's his name, Aquino. You know, well, uh, several people are of the opinion that absolutely he is. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because he had an obsession with the Dante's Inferno mm -hmm. and hell. And he considered himself uh, just kind of a god where he could destroy your career or make it just at whim. So, and yeah, I would add huge. that, that, Michael, that General Michael Hayden, uh, he came in to eviscerate NSA, like I said, um, and he actually sent Barbara McNamara, who was the deputy director and had won awards. She was the first deputy director, I believe. He sent her off to London and replaced her with Bill Black Jr., um, through research has turned out to be one of these people who is targeting innocent people for death to, to collect insurance, trust, uh, trust funds, and uh, uh, insurance on uh, co-owned properties with these people. In fact, he's so proud of himself that he's nicknamed, nicknamed himself the snuffer. Mm -hmm. People out. He's that much of a psychopath. So bringing uh, Bill Black Jr. back out of retirement because he had spent uh, from, I don't know, 1959 to 1997 maybe at NSA, retired, went to SAIC, S-A-I-C, and then uh, General Hayden called him back to be deputy director and an ending deputy director, an award-winning deputy director, Barbara McNamara, was just before 9-11. My question is, would Barbara McNamara not go along with the plans for 9-11? So she got moved to London, and Bill Black Jr. was more than happy to come. And uh, then we have, we've talked about before, telling us that several of the 9-11 very unique names of the victims have turned out to be uh, victims also of identity theft, insurance fraud, trust fraud, and um, real estate fraud. So did they spend the few months before 9-11 taking out insurance policies on these people, Hayden and Black, and maybe others? It needs to be answered because the, the seems to indicate that's very possible. Mm -hmm. and, and I they just got want... so greedy and they continued it with the targeted individual program. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add to that, Karen, and say that, yes, these are subjects that we've talked about in our recent podcast with Midge and with you, um, our very opening podcast with Ahmed and, Ahmed and Ani and myself. And uh, we're going to be publishing those podcasts toward the end of this week, hopefully this weekend. And I'll send the links to Paul as well so he could, you know, put the links up. So all of the inside information that Karen's just talking about is talked about at length on these two podcasts. If we're going to talk about Satanism, I've been working on something this week. Um, I think that calling them psychopaths is a real disservice because that seems to indicate they have a mental disorder. I think it's way beyond that in species. I think we're talking about a different lineage. I sent, uh, actually, I sent Catherine a couple, uh, I think I sent Weird Ways of the Elite documentary out, which talks about their, the, what they like in art, which is this sadomasochistic thing, horrible thing. Um, how, how, you know, what they eat. They're, 
they're just very different. And then I send one Freemason prison, Hollywood, music, sports. It shows that all these people that are influential positions in Hollywood have these Masonic rings or some identification with the beast. So, you know, I, every time that every time comes up, I call my friend David Beverly, who knows the Bible. I, I certainly don't know the Bible. And he said, read uh, Genesis 3.15. And so I went to that, and uh, he's t this, this particular verse takes place in the Garden of Eden. And it, it's God talking uh, to the, the snake and the woman. And he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. So we're talking about, I think, a whole different lineage here. They don't think like we do, they don't act like we do, and calling them a psychopath makes it sound like it's a mental disorder. It's not a mental disorder. It's basic wiring, I think. Now, the people that are working for them, that are corrupted, that are parapsychopaths because uh, they've been bribed into it or seduced into it, I think that's totally different. Uh, but you talk about the people at the, at the top, uh, like this guy that, that influenced the, uh, the NSA and those types of people. I think we're dealing with total, something totally different than humanity. They look like us in our holographic reality, but uh, they I don't think like us, they don't act like us. Go ahead. I have one question, Paul, if that's the case. If they're wired so differently and if they're so, you know, so much another species and so forth, how come they're only at the top of our organizations? You know what I mean? Are they everywhere, in other words? I mean, what's the percentage of this population that you estimate? Oh, I don't know what the population is. There's supposed to be millions of statements, but I don't know how many of these, uh, these, there's these people there are. They're... Uh, well, they pull one another on top. If you take skull and bone and the lineage of skull and bones and, and uh, how they promote one another and put one another in positions, the, the trick is they know who they are. They know what we're doing. They know what they're doing, but we don't. We're told, we just think they're misguided people or people who might have been corrupted or have a, have a, have a mental disorder or, or they, here's the big one. They know more than we do, you know. They know what's going on in Syria, so you know they're they're going to do the right thing. They they don't. They're not on your side. They're working against you. They're working. They're killing us. And until we realize that they're different from us, I mean, look at Michael Aquino. I mean, for heaven's sakes, he was a top general. He was head of the the intelligence mechanism throughout all of the United States and probably all of the world. He was, he supposedly, the story is, he got thrown out of the church of Satan. Why? Because he was too evil. He had to make his own, yeah. he had to make his own church, the church of Set. I mean, this guy is dark. If you do any research on him, he's just totally dark. And there wasn't any holding back. There wasn't any, no, I'm just a regular guy. I just have this hobby, I'm a Satan. No, he was totally, totally a Satanist. And he was, he should have been, actually spent his life in jail because he was a, and there was a big scandal with him and a, a daycare center that he and his outfit was running out there and taking kids to his house. And so they're open, they're telling us who they are, they're telling us what they are. Mm -hmm. But I think we're doing ourselves a disservice by considering them human psychopaths, because I don't, I don't think they are. So you can chew on that for a minute. But, uh, yeah, I've been ca <laughs> calling these counterfeit humans, you know, and I had a discussion with a friend of mine, because in Christianity, you're supposed to pray for your enemies. And she said, Karen, these people are indwelled by demons. Why would you pray for a demon? And so I said, hmm, that's a very good point. I can't really, you know. Mm -hmm. So that uh, is a spiritual dilemma. You know, because you mm -hmm. cannot pray for them like you pray for a misguided neighbor because they are demonically controlled, and I'm not going to pray for a demon. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think also, I guess, um, Paul, when when I was mentioning, you know, what percentage, etc., and you said there's a lot of Satanists, etc., so it's, in a sense, it seems we're talking about the species of, this very large species, you know, very large numbers of, of um, generational, multi-generational Satanic families, the Illuminati, the Khazarian maf- Mafia, the, Kab- the Cabal, and their minions. I mean, those are different terms, I think, that all of us have come across as we read and try to find out more about who is doing this and what they are doing and so forth. Um, but it seems like, in a sense, we're talking about the same people, right? The same people who seem yeah. to be ranged against us. We're talking about the beast with a thousand names. Uh, we're talking about the Jesuits. We're talking about the Freemasons. We're talking about Skull and Bones. There's, there are, I guess there are many other um, Secret societies and fraternities in different colleges that are all hooked into this organization. Now, I don't think they're all that separate species, which I need to find a name for. Uh, well, uh, Karen, isn't it? You're more familiar with the Bible. Maybe you can help me with that. But um, no, there, there's a, there's it's a whole lot of not with a colleague worshippers. What's that? I said it kind of strikes me like a resurgence of a death cult. I think there was a death cult in India that worshipped Kali, if I'm if I'm right. Um, well, yeah, yes, but- and you know, actually, I have to say, Kali and Durga, and these are these sort of uh, figures of mother goddesses in India that have been sort of transformed into death and destruction goddesses. You know, because if you trace back into the history, which I have done a little bit of, you will find that they came, that they derived from goddesses of fertility and goddesses of rain and goddesses of harvest who became transformed over time by the top caste in India, the Brahmin caste. Um, I'm going to get a lot of flack from this from every Indian watching, no doubt, but I've done the research. And (laughs) and into uh, goddesses of death and destruction, you know, garlands of skulls around their neck and so forth. And these goddesses, Durga and Kali, are supposed to be so demonic looking and so forth because they battle demons. Um, but um, I wanted, some of the research that I've done, at least in the south of India, is that the, it's all very, you know, in India, the, the caste system is so ancient. It goes back into ancient time. But it also goes back into ancient time but, to the point where it all began and there was a top caste. You know, the Brahmins are associated with the Aryans who supposedly came down from Persia and invaded India and so forth. And then there's this whole, um, you know, hierarchy of castes. So one very interesting thing that I found out actually when I was researching my first novel is that the, the, the Brahmins, in a sense, had the lowest caste. the the untouchables who were kept from entering the village temple, they had them uh, engage in worship of this transformed southern mother goddess, who was the goddess of fertility and rain, into a goddess of destruction. And they had ceremonies where they had ritual possessions of demons by these untouchables. So in a sense, they were propitiating or placating their gods, which were demons. Very weird, very strange, has to do with power and control and all that stuff. So, you know, yes, you're right, Karen, to, 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 to sort of come back to that point. Um, yeah, it's very questionable whether these goddesses in India who do uh, project um, death and destruction and de- demonic possession, it's questionable whether they were always that way, you know, and whether and to what extent the satanic cult that is that I think Paul knows a great deal about, you know, from uh, other cultures, but the connections over there to these Indian um, worships as well. From the Indian, I I like to follow the yuga cycles. No, go ahead, Catherine. I can can chime this in later. Karen, please. Uh Uh-oh. Karen. Karen, can you hear us? I, you cut out a little bit. Oh, okay, because they're kind of freezing, both your video and your audio, it sounds like, because we can hear you a minute ago. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, I'm having a little trouble. Some of you get tinny, and I don't understand what you're saying, but as long as the audience understands, that's great. They're having some sound issues. They're having sound issues, they're saying, but they're loving the conversation. Certainly Good. the... Uh, guys love the beginning of the shield. We we went all over the place here. 
Well, actually, you know what, Paul, I think you should say what you, you wanted to say about the cycles, and I would just love to throw in, you know, the, the, the science point after this, because it's been hugely interesting, and it's so interesting to hear that um, something similar has happened in India, which to me sounds like, literally, I, I'm, I'm sorry I'm coming with this again, but it sounds like classic deep capture, right? It sounds like, you know, people it's, can... It's captured, absolutely captured. In uh, India, there's a number of cycles, and the cycles, mm -hmm. I think, it's been bastardized a little bit by recent incarnations, but it's basically human beings uh, go through, uh, they go from a golden age to uh, a silver age to a bronze age, and then they go through a short uh, iron age, which is also called the Kali Yuga. And I would think that the way it's characterized is that there's no evil in the golden age. It's uh, 25% in the Silver Age, 50% in the uh, Bronze Age, and 75% in the Kali Yuga, which is where we are. And as we go through this Kali Yuga, I don't know, we, we go through, and there's plenty of evidence that people in succeeding Yugas were larger, smarter, they could do more things technologically. I mean, uh, the, the, um, the pyramids, uh, go 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 I can never pronounce that. Uh, I mean, these are places where these beings that were probably us, as they go through and they came into this fall, and, and Christianity does the fall of man too. It's it's the same thing, and they also use. And David Beverly was talking to me about the silver, uh, gold, silver, bronze, and then the the Iron Age. And as we go through the Iron Age, it's 75% evil. So we're fighting against a force that's so much greater than us in humanity, which is basically good. So we're trying to work our way out of this Kali Yuga, and there's tons of lessons from it. I mean, it's as a training program, it's the most incredibly wonderfully designed thing. I mean, as a selection program, it's not so much. As a, as a train, as a development program, boy, it was incredible. So the evidences of the Kali Yuga would be language. When we were in the Golden Age, we did not need language. We knew. We did not eat. When we went through the Silver Age, we became more and more dense, and we had to do things uh, more, uh, uh, more routinely. I think we had to start eating. Then, eating and then when you go into the bronze age we're eating and we can't communicate telepathically anymore so we have spoken language and then they, and then we were given the written language and you'll find that magyar and sanskrit and all those ancient languages are so much more sophisticated and complicated and um, able to communicate so much better than our rudimentary languages today even german i'm sure which is a which is a high language. So as we fell, I think our species gave us things to help us through this 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 rough time that we're going through right now. And uh, so so I do think we're up against something. Our taskmaster now is not human. These these people they're very much empowered in the Kali Yuga. Uh, they're very non-human. And I don't think we can defeat them or even confront them as long as we consider them human psychopaths. This is my notion. And I haven't bounced this off of anybody except Mindy. Uh, and she likes my thinking anyway. But uh, so, so I think the first step is to realize that we're at war. Uh, you can, there are plenty of evidence that human beings cycle through war like the Seculum. We went through the war, the Second World War. I actually, it started in 25 and went to 45. That was a crisis period. Then there's a high period. Then there's a awakening. That, that was uh, 65 to 85 when we were all uh, letting the sun shine in. You know, we were all, you guys weren't, I was. But, and then through, uh, and then there's the unraveling, which would be 85 to 2005. 
and 2005 to 225 were in another crisis. The last time we were in a crisis, these demons had us fighting one another. They had us uh, Germans fighting the the uh, Americans, fighting the English, fighting the Bolsheviks, fighting the. They were all. They had us fighting one another, and they're trying to do that again. What we need to do this time is during this crisis period is realizing that we're fighting a different species. We're fighting these demons. They're not demons. They're, I don't know what to call them. Maybe we can call them the bankers. <laughs> they can, we can call them the banking elite. They call them the elites, but that's a real nice name. But they're, they're not like that. Oh, they're, they're not elites. I think we need to find a different name. <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, I, oh God, I'm burning to I'm burning to jump in here right now because yes, please do you know, I, I absolutely I, I love your idea um, about them being um, thinking about them as a different species because I think in a sense they are. Um, you know, I, um, I the other thing is also that they are fundamentally evil and warped and nothing like us. They are fundamentally not like us, and the entire logic is not like ours. You know, actually, um, if you can cheat somebody out and and um, harm them, they consider it to be a bonus point. You know, they they consider it a job well done. It's the sort of worship of cunning and worship of cruelty, which is, um, you know, for lack of a better word, I will call it psychopathic. Um, but I'll, I'll get into what Paul suggested as thinking about them as a totally different species, because one of the things I want to draw people's attention to is. Um, when, when we talk about the psychopath being mentally ill, it almost sounds like, oh, you know, you, you get an illness. So you're fine at first, and then you get an illness, and that's your mental illness. But that's not what psychopathy is, um, as now in neuroscience found out. It, when you're a psychopath, a real psychopath, you're a natural born psychopath. You're born that way, you're hard, hardwired that way, and there's nothing you can do to change it. And there's one um, neuroscientist, and let me just share my screen because actually let me first stick the link to so people can actually um, look at it into the um, forum um, let me just uh, paste it in and um, this is the link that's now in the chat and to my colleagues let me just paste it here into the um, Google Hangouts so that you can click on the link as well um, what this is it's an um, it is a neuroscientist called um, Michael Fallon and uh, sorry James Fallon and let me just share my screen for a moment I I like to show you this article because James Fallon, um, he found out that he is a psychopath. The neuroscientist who discovered he was a psychopath. And um, it's very interesting because James Fallon also did the TED talk, um, which is very interesting. And um, what he was um, just a neuroscientist studying psychopathy. And then he scanned himself and his family and he left, I think, as he explains in the TED talk, he just left the, the scans on his desk and didn't have time to look at them. And later on, he came back to look at them and forgot who's this, you know, which is which. And then he went through and then you can see um, two in this um, on this image, two brain um, brain scans. And the top is a normal brain and the bottom is that of a psychopath. And he looked at the bottom um, um, one and he said, oh, that's wonderful. You know, that that is a classic scan brain scan of a, a psychopath. I wonder, wonder who this is. And he looked at it and it was his own. Um, and then he realized, oh my God, I'm a psychopath. And then he thought that makes a lot of sense actually because there was a lot of things he couldn't understand why people act a certain way. But if you look at the brain scans, you can see different areas of activity and different areas of inactivity. And um, also you can see that the middle bit is a, it's essentially just hollow. I mean, no activity at all. If you look at the size, you know, here, and, and here, you can see that the, the, the structure of the activity is completely different. So, because I'm not a neuroscientist, the way I understand it is that it looks like there are some modules inactivated. There are some modules missing in his head. And these modules are all for, um, uh, for empathy um, and, and, and compassion. Um, sorry, this is empathy and compassion, and I never know what it is. But anyway, um, but the point is that this is a higher order projection. You project your emotions into somebody else and do essentially a virtual reality mapping of his world, and you realize, oh, that is not a good, you know, good place to be in. That's a, it's, it's actually a higher brain function. Now, if you've got modules missing in your head, you can't do that, and you will go through life never, ever actually wanting to do that, and you think about yourself and your own viewpoint, and that's that. Um, you know, so um, 
it's, I, I, I think Paul is in a sense right that they are different species. Well, they're not a different species, but they are different to us in a way that it cannot be um, changed. And, and this sort of difference is also hereditary. And I think it is actually James Fallon who, who talks in his TED talk about the fact that um, when he was, um, sorry, let me just um, switch back. When he was talking about this, um, he, he was giving talks around the country and at some point his, his mother got to know and, and, and she said, you know, if I were you, I would shut up about the psychopaths. And, and he said, but why? It's my research. And she said, well, don't you know, your ancestors were serial killers. And there were, you know, several serial killers in his, his family. And his mom was very busy shut, you know, hushing it all up and trying to make them live like a normal family. But they had these convicted serial killers, if I remember correctly. So people best watch his book. But, um, you know, it is hereditary. So this sort of stuff is her hereditary. But um, it could be a, a genetic defect, you know, just like you pass on brown eyes and it could be dominant or not so dominant trait. Um, but then you end up with people who are fundamentally different and there's no way they become, can become like us. No way we can become like them. This sort of total lack of, of um, I personally, I consider it a higher sort of brain projection. Um, um, because you do two things. Number one is you simulate what the other person feels. And then you also simulate that it's not a good thing if their misery is left because it can spread and it can take down the entire system. It's a longer term protection and it's, I think, a higher order way of thinking. You know? Um, I think um, one example I have is um, I think I get I think I get feedback from Karen's microphone. I think people are playing around with um, Karen's background. Okay, now it's gone. Um, sorry. Um, so one one um, example I have of this, which um, every child goes through, and it shows you how important it is these higher level projections. Um, I I call it the mountain problem. Okay, and the mountain problem is something that you learn to solve as a child. So what do I mean with the mountain problem? When you have children um, and they are very young, they can't do projections. They can't put themselves into another person's body or situation. Um, and the way you can you can tell is that um, a little test that they run on little children and you um, take them into a room and you show them, you know, a little cardboard cutout of three mountains. Okay. And you ask them what you see and they will say, oh, I see three mountain peaks. And then you take a little doll and you put the doll on top of one of the mountains and then the doll looks down on the other two and you say to the child, what does the doll see? And little children will say three mountains. You know, because they can see three mountains, but they don't do the projection of, okay, but the doll is sitting on one and is seeing two. But with age, eventually, the children overcome the mountain problem, and they say, oh, the doll will see two mountains, because they can do this higher order projection. Okay, so that is children. Um, but this sort of higher order projection problem, we have all throughout our societies, even if you don't have, if you're not a psychopath, because sometimes, you know, you have it over and over when you call customer services, you know, you have a problem, you've no idea how the systems work, they're totally opaque, but the customer service, um, you know, um, assistant is dealing with the same problem, you know, 50 times per hour or 50 times per day. And when you call for the umpteenth time with the same problem, they get mad at you because they can't do the projection. They don't think, oh, hang on, this person is coming in. They're not dealing with what I'm dealing with every day. You know, they just looked through their own tunnel vision, not doing the projection, and they just get mad at you. And it's almost like, oh, you know, <laughs> for the umpteenth time, you do this, you click on that, and then you select that option, you know? that sort of answer. Now that is a person not being able to handle the mountain problem because either they are not intelligent enough or they are so tired they can't be bothered to think. You know, so these sort of projections, if you can't do them, you're operating effectively at a lower level of intelligence and you know it makes our society, which is reliant on us being able to understand each other in a much more complex way, makes it really dysfunctional. Now, I suspect that with psychopaths having these modules off in their head or flat out missing, they are not doing these projections. And by not doing these projections, never thinking about what it, what it means to be in somebody else's situation and what it means for the greater good, at first instance, you become highly efficient because you never bother thinking about this stuff. So you just backstab people and you just rise to the top and you never shed a tear. You know, you walk over corpses. 
and it makes you very efficient to rise to the top. But when you're at the top and you have to coordinate a big complex system, you have to be able to take in information from absolutely everybody and make decisions, not what it looks like to you at the top, but make this decisions for what the situation is like on the ground. Now, if you can't do these high order projections, you will be a me, me, me person, you know, and at first it will look like the organization is making decisions really fast, but it will be making bad decisions really fast. So you end up with this, this sort of thing. And then we already talked about this sieve effect where if you're really ruthless, and these people effectively are, um, then you rise to the top very quickly. And that's why these pyramid organizations, as you know, um, Paul Marco says, are psychopath magnets. And what's so interesting because this is a system effect. You know, so it's a statistical selection process. Um, and as soon as you have a pyramid organization, you have these effects. And pyramid organizations arise naturally because we're group animals, we tend to follow a leader. So what you described, Ramola, is, is just so classic because you have these um, castes in Indian society. It's a pyramid organization. You've got people at the top, but then also you have psychopaths at the bottom and they just want to be at the top. So they will sit down and they will quite consciously and calculatingly think about how can we get to the top? And to get to the top, we have to destroy. So we have to worship destruction and we have to make other people destroy for us to have an amplification effect. And you, you end up with this, with this stuff. Um, so I think in a sense, you know, um, Paul might be right. We're dealing with a different sort of, well, not necessarily species, but, you know, maybe we're dealing with some people who are just fundamentally different. And, and you know, when you look at these brain scans, you also understand why people go on about the reptilians, you know. Um, I think number one is because these people actually do act like crocodiles, you know, they do not have the higher function group um, functionality, you know, and also open brackets. I think there's once once people think like that, the intelligence agencies also want to bullshit people by, you know, enforcing the sort of thinking and then dressing up as reptilians and doing all sorts of, you know, fog and mirror tricks, I bet you, on their own name. And also in that image that you just showed us of the, the two brains, it looked like in the second one, the, the back part of the brain was all lit up, right? Uh, let me have a look. The I'm reptilian look part? I'm just going to look back. So yes, so the control means is this is a, um, the control at the top is a normal person, I think, yeah? And this bottom bit is, the, um, is um, Jim Fallon's scan, so the psychopath scan. And... Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're saying, what were you saying? The, the bottom bit. You know, those little darker, in a darker areas where that arrow is pointing down there on the picture. Yes, yes, exactly. And you've also got yes, all of that exactly. So these are the two two differences. Yeah, you have this, You know, here you have um, activity, and here it's it's almost swapped. You know. Yeah. 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 And also look at the structure of this. You know. And and also notice this little um, area like that's totally missing there. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's missing. Okay. Now, from from a non-scientist, uh, not so educated point of view, it looks like the frontal lobe is more complex than the normal person, meaning that they have the inhibitions against just smacking somebody, yeah. um, and that's yeah. in the area that is dark. The, one of the areas that seems to not be functioning is the pineal gland, which I believe is the seat of all emotions. Which one is, is the, that correct? Which one is that? Can you just move my, can you see my cursor here? The mouse cursor. Yes. Could you move to the right and yeah, a little bit more to the right. And is the pineal gland somewhere in that area? Is, is a it little bit higher? Is it this it's right Yes. It's supposed to be the middle of the brain. That's right. It's right okay. in the middle. That bit, so that's not okay. active here at all. Okay. Right. So they cannot emotionally bond with human being or or God if they understand the concept of God. Yeah. So is that why? Oops. Because people have been saying that they have um, brain bleeding. I think in this area is it because these psychopaths are trying to fry this area so that we're more like mm -hmm. them. Right. That that Paul knows robot. a lot about the pineal gland, right? Yeah, I think when they I think when this is going to be way off the topic then. I think when they die, they die. I think that's why they fear death so much. I hope so. <laughs> I mean, hope so. I, in the middle there, it looked like the reptilian brain was in the dark part. I'm 
I'm surprised. Catherine, they're not dying anytime soon, though. They're wreaking havoc all around the world. <laughs> we haven't talked about the second part today yet. <laughs> I've got a plan. Well, that's why they're so interested in transferring their consciousness into a more robot, robotic or animal-like body. That's why they're mm -hmm. that's why they're obsessed with that, uh, and they think if they achieve that mortality by transferring their uh, their consciousness, which isn't it's, it's not spirit, it's just consciousness, into another another vehicle, then they can achieve uh, immoral immortality, and they think that's godness. That's what they think being a god is. Mm -hmm. We have it. We don't have to get it. We have it, but because they're different than us. Also, if we look at it from another another model, here's another model. You know, Piaget, Piaget used to look at children and notice how they go from one stage to another, to another, to another. Well, there's a very sophisticated model that takes it very high, and it's called Lovinger's model. And uh, on the, on the lower level, when a child is two, three, four years old, they go through a, a stage that's called the self-protective stage. It's the me, me, me stage. It's all about me and it's a crazy stage. Then when they get around five or six, they go into the conformist stage, which is when they're ready to go to school and learn what little girls do and little boys do. And they proceed from there that I studied uh, goes all the way up to higher levels of consciousness. And in higher levels of consciousness, you do things like you identify with all humanity. You feel the pain of all humanity. You try, you're devoted to, to yourself growing and growing all of humanity on the high, high, high level. But it's always been said in this, the person who invented this model, or not invented it, but found it. Uh, she says that there's never been a government that didn't act totally on the self-protective level. And so what I'm going to tell you is that these, uh, what we're going to call them, psychopaths right now, never get into the conformist stage. They stay at that stage below. That's a kind of a psychopathic stage below when we go in, before we start the school. It's all about me. It's all about my wants. It's total worship of the ego. And that's where they stay, where there's a lot of us, and a lot of us that are waking up seem to be on a higher level because we're listening to the, the cries and moans of other people, and we're empathetic with that. So it's, it's, it's a real war. It's like the psychopaths against the anti-psychopaths. When people become aware of what's going on, they get higher and higher. You see, the way the model works is on dilemmas. You have a, you have a, a platform, an ego, a bunch of ideas that keep things in place for you. And when you're confronted with dilemmas, like a divorce, that really does it. And what you guys are going through, that really does it. You're Concept doesn't, doesn't work anymore. So what you either do is you incorporate these other ideas that you're having now and it makes it a more sophisticated conceptualization of reality, or you hold it in um, uh, two different parts of your brain. What's it called? Cognitive, Cognitive dissonance. And, and, and you just stay where you are. When you incorporate it, you grow, and you keep growing the more dilemmas that you're faced. And as you get higher, you incorporate the dilemmas of other people. You, you do some research. You see what people are going through, and it, it upsets you so much that you incorporate a higher level of conceptualization and see yourself as being bigger, not just you in this little body, but you as a species. And you as all of all of all of, all of uh, existence. So, as we get higher, we can see these assholes for really what they are: the stunted growth, stuck in three-year-old behavior of the psychopath. So that's another way to look at the difference between us and them. 
we have the ability to grow and learn and develop. That's what this whole thing's about, as far as I'm concerned. They don't. There are, uh, there are. They might be our mentors. They might be our, ter our, our tormentors, causing us, causing these dilemmas that cause this advancement. Doesn't feel good, and we've got to stop it. But uh, that's just another way to look at these this group of people that we're, we have to deal with all the time. I think that is absolutely fantastic because um, one of the, one of the um, there, there are two thoughts I have, and maybe I'll start with the, the, the more sophisticated one, because what you said um, about incorporating other dilemmas and, and then just growing outwards and you know playing those through in your mind, um, in terms of systems, what it actually does, you, you, can, you can imagine yourself in a big organigram, and let's just say it's a pyramid because that's what most things are. And you're just a, a little, you know, I mean, on paper, that's what most things are. In real life, it's actually more like a flat network, and you have links to other people. So that's what the real human complex systems look like. But on paper, you're in this big organization, or a state or whatever. Um, and then if you consider yourself to have connections, say to your boss or somebody or to the organization, the corporation you work with, to the state, you know, you're in the continent and so on. You can, you can compartmentalize it like that. But if you start thinking about problems outside, what you're doing is you are transcending your actual little position in the node and you are spreading out in terms of the information you're pooling and the processing you're doing of problems or information outside of your circle. So what you, if you wanted to map this, what you do is you put up, you, you grow tentacles to other parts of the organization. You do, you do what the human brain sometimes does, which is connect, not just um, bits that are closest to each other, but also you know, grow more complex things. And that's what you're doing. And through this complexity, through this interconnectivity, that's when you can have higher, um, you know, move to a higher level. Otherwise, you've got a really dumb engine, essentially. You know, if you think about it in terms of physics and engineering, you know, if everything just works in a pyramid, it's very predictable and it's very easy to calculate, but you can't do very fancy things because it's also predictable. However, if you suddenly start reaching out and start interconnecting, you get this, this turmoil, this turbulence, this chaos, this nonlinearity, and it's through the nonlinearity that small change can make huge differences. So, it, what you're describing to me, if I want to map it somehow as a physicist would, um, I can see why that actually brings humanity to a much higher level because it is through the nonlinearity and this complexity that we solve complex problems, actually. So what, um, if you really want to have the most vibrant society, and, and that's actually where it all, um, you know, uh, if, if you ever wanted to get through to these people who are, in, in my view, just thick as a brick, you know, um, the only way they understand is through power and money. And one of the things that also follows from this complexity is that you will have more wealth. I mean, remember, there's a difference between money and wealth. But you will have more wealth creation in a complex interconnected society precisely because of this nonlinearity. Suddenly, if you interconnect people who have money with the ideas, you will create something new. You will create wealth. If that interconnection doesn't happen, you don't create it. So actually, if you wanted to get through to the head of the mafia, to the head of the snake, why we need to cycle our systems, it is to produce more wealth so that they actually get richer. There will be more stuff for them to enjoy if they just let us do these interconnections. If they keep us in our you know, pyramid organization, it's like sitting on a bicycle. You know, you can turn the bicycle and you will advance, but it will be just a freaking bicycle. It's not going to suddenly be a jet engine or something, you know, or something much more fancy. It just won't happen. And what we are doing as society is we're sitting on a bicycle because the, the systems we have are still, they are forcing us into this corset, you know. They are forcing us through the school education the, the way they do. They are forcing us to ingest, you know, um, vaccines that are meant to protect us, but they also want to poison us to keep us down. And by operating the systems the way they do, because they're such retarded little children, you know, they are actually holding themselves back. And now comes the key, actually, because now it is clear that the systems can't stay the way they are. So now the clever psychopaths will pull away from the pack by, by realizing we need to cycle on systems faster so that they get more powerful and get one up on the other psychopaths. 
And I predict that the society that's going to win and the psychopaths that are going to win are those who actually understand the mathematics or the computer science or the structure behind it and understand that if they really want to change something quickly and become much more powerful than they've ever been, they have to make the systems much more interconnected and much more nonlinear. And that's just how it is because then they will still be on the top because of systems effects. You know, there's not that many ways you can accumulate money. You know, but there are all these people who are want to create new stuff, who are there to create wealth. That's the difference between a psychopath and us. We want to create wealth. They want to just create money as quickly as possible to, you know, rule over us. So, but this is it. They still be at the top. But if they allow us to create wealth, they will be on, on at the tip of a rocket ship. If they don't, and we're stuck in these shitty old systems, right, because of the Vatican and the bankers and all this, they'll be sitting on a bicycle. But they are in competition against other psychopaths. So, you know, that's why any nation, if China or Russia figures this out, they will clear the deck, really, in just a few years. That's I think that that may be well on its way to happening, actually, Catherine, because actually what Paul talked about, you know, you've got these people stuck in the one to five year old stage and then you've got the vast majority of humanity who've moved on and who are working and struggling to evolve truly in many ways, including spiritually moving upward, you know, in every way, empathetically and so forth. Yet you've got this small minority employing their hoodlums whatever you want to call them, their demons, their minions, their infragods, their vigilantes, you know, their satanic families, to sit down on top of our heads and impose like surveillance states on us, impose control mechanisms on us, including destruction mechanisms, such as what you mentioned. Like and it even gets so petty attack. as to... Yes, uh, and I was going to bring up again the uh, Pentecostal pastor who does YouTube videos on prophecy who told, I think it's Leah Liaz, another woman who does YouTube programs, that he was visited by two NSA agents who told him to shut up. Where was he getting his information about prophecy? And he said, the Bible. And they said, well, we don't like it. We need you to shut up. So they wanted to, to stifle his interpretation of prophecy in the Bible that he was telling people. I mean, how long has the Bible been around? And they wanted him to censor himself and not get prophecy that was disturbing uh, to them because they said, how do these people know this? That we're doing this. That's very interesting. And so they because sent people to threaten him. And three days later, he was in a, in a uh, choreographed car accident. Oh, my gosh. You see, they're, tra they're trying yeah, he to... He was, uh, I forget his name, but he's the one who comes on the YouTube and says something like, uh, you believe it, or, or something like that. But, uh, you know, threatening somebody to shut up about Bible prophecy? Are you kidding me? You know? Because they want to have, you know, the last dibs on the predictive programming as well, that they're feeding to the rest of us, you know, so that we can all project what they want us to project and look forward to the sort of chaotic future they want us to look forward to instead of any other kind of prophecy, you know, whether it's looking forward to a golden age or looking forward to judgment day or the rapture or whatever, you know, so they want to control it all. Yeah. And I think that that arises yeah. out of their condition, you know, and um, I was just, whilst we were talking, uh, we, I was, I was reading the, um, the forum and someone said, Oh, we're, you know, now we're off into the sci-fi. They said that earlier when we we're talking about, structure it's like no we're not we're actually still sticking to science and we're sometimes saying the same thing with different different words and then somebody just said oh we're so off topic now and it's true the original um announcement was we're talking about shielding and the military but this is really important to understand when we're talking about the military everything that we said because we just discussed psychopaths whatever to call them they are different species we discussed deep capture and when you're dealing with these, the military, it's also true that they are ancient, rusty old bicycles because you have this top-down mechanism. So the general said to top, I just like turning it, you know, like a bicycle, you know, as it's rolling along. And overall, the entire structure is so utterly moronic. It's, it's unbelievable. And they are okay. the themselves. You know, we have the heads of so-called military intelligence taking down their own countries and obliterating everything around for their own children. 
I mean, how freaking dumb can you get, you know? Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's a, that's a psychopathic brain. And I think we had to do all of this to now really rip into the military. And before we do that, I, I'm sorry, I can't do this because it's for me, it's so important when we talk about the military. We asked, what shall we call them? Because psychopath sounds like and and it's true, they have an angle of So, you know, but the psychopaths are still different from, from these weaponized morons, you know, because they sometimes are highly intelligent, but at the same time they're not. They're missing a bit, they're missing some modules. And um, it's 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 really funny, but somebody um, remarked on my on my YouTube channel and uh, and and he or she said, I'm so tired of calling them the fucking retards all the time. I just termed them the fuck tards. And I thought, that stuck with me. And every single time I think about the military, I think, yeah, they're literally the empire of fuck tards. Because they, are, they fuck things up. They are so incredibly stupid. And today I can say it because Millicent isn't around. I hope she doesn't watch this episode. But literally, that's the best term I have for them. And it's totally disrespectful because they are idiots. They are absolute idiots. If you actually now think about what has the military actually done, you know, they claim that they have some sort of insight about military strategy. And when we look at it, what we're now discovering is that all this pedophilia is going on, you know, already past heads, you know, past past heads, long past heads of MI5 and MI6 have been accused of having engaged in this pedophilia. So they took part in all this and they never actually understood what this control mechanism actually was about. They never thought, hang on, we are screwing our own children. Does, does that not seem funny to somebody? Because anybody who thinks about it for longer than three seconds realizes, hang on, there must be a foreign takeover because we are screwing our own children and we're mutilating our own women. Mm -hmm. Isn't that fun? You know, isn't that interesting? And there's one line I want to add in, and that's from these blog posts called MI5 and MI6 Exposed, which blew my mind because um, at some point they are talking about how they're being, you know, a monarch programmed and they are, you know, brain split and all that. And they are conditioned to, um, to be attracted to women. Okay, so you have, you know, in this sort of, in those posts, um, you know, then later people who became heads of military intelligence, conditioning the training to feel attracted to, to Asian women. And I'm thinking, okay, guys, whilst you were doing that, did you ever think twice what that could have possibly been about? Because there are two explanations. Number one, that's what military intelligence does when they want to infiltrate another country, okay? So you make your staff marry the other side, you know, that's why, for example, um, I mean, in Germany, I saw so many people who turned out to be agent, um, agent, either they spoke Chinese or they're Chinese wives. So that's intelligence, training the agents to marry the Chinese to, you know, kind of know what's going on on a really deep level. So you would, en you would encourage your agents to marry the other side if there's some sort of military operation coming in the next 10, 20 years with the other side. So, you know, Asian women, okay, something to do with Asia, you know. But also, it was specifically, I mean, in British um, English, Asian also means, um, you know, not just Far East Asian, it also means Indian and Pakistani and Bangladeshi. So, it could be that there's some sort of military operation planned over the next 20, 30 years in that region, or else, and then it suddenly makes a lot more sense when you take everything else into account, didn't we hear about sort of vaccines that were tailored towards certain genetics? And didn't we hear something about vaccines trying to wipe out people with Indian heritage or making them infertile? Okay, now anybody trying to wipe out the Indian people, given that they are billions, will have a very hard time. So these vaccines are not really designed, you know, for that, but if you make your British agents, your British people, or the leaders of your elites, your establishment, you actually brainwash them into marrying agents, and then your offspring will have that genetics, and you're pumping them with vaccines, wiping them out. Well, I'm sorry, there are a lot fewer British than there are Indians. You will end up wiping out the British. That's what your idea. So you literally have people in the 1970s training their British agents and that's so-called military intelligence doing it 
to be ready to be wiped out in the year 2020 when these va vaccines are just let loose on Britain. And when I read that, I thought, oh my God, do, do you guys actually think further than, than your shoelaces? Because that's what we're seeing. And now, as I said, as far as I can tell, the business plan, and that's why we have these takedown operations of the intelligentsia, because that's what you're seeing here. When we are being targeted, this is an intelligence action. This is obliterating, murdering the intelligent people, the articulate people, so that only the gibbering morons are left, so that when you invade, there's no one to even tell their head from their rear side. Mm -hmm. So that's what this is in action. And it seems to be conducted in the US and in Europe. And I said, it seems to be the only business plan I can think about is if you want to take over this country, you asset strip the royal household, you asset strip the billionaires in the US, and you asset strip Switzerland. And they can wipe them out so that they can't complain about it. And it what, is. Sorry. I was going to say, it's a takedown also of the US and Europe, definitely. But you know, the same thing is going on in places like Australia, New Zealand, actually in India too, you know, the same kind of program. So it, it, the, the thing that you were talking about, the intelligent, oh, how did you say that word again? German expression, it's called, it, it, the, this is the Gestapo, what the Gestapo did in Poland, the intelligenz action. So they, they wiped out the intelligentsia in Poland. They, they rounded them up on, in the street and shot them in the head, and then they invaded. Yeah, um, I remember that and in Poland. And in fact, even universities, they would go and like pull the people, you know, professors out of universities and so forth. Yeah, so you're right. So they're kind of doing that, but in a minimal kind of way. But they're still taking over communities, you yeah. know, around the country through through the targeted individual program, you know, targeting certain people in every community and having whole concentric circles of control around them. So they're taking over communities, lying to them, lying, deception, national security letters, all this nonsense, you know. And uh, but, but all I wanted to say was it's happening worldwide, you know. So it's like the true but the one thing that's really going to kill the british if i may put it like that is that um it there's a there's a well there's a size effect so if you do this program in india you know india in, in many ways is a lot more resilient you know because okay you can run it but it's just you still have very strong family structures you know you have very strong community structures in some communities you can really individual in others it will just lead to to family warfare you know so there, even though it doesn't look like it, they have a much, much harder time because, um, you know, people just out far to remote areas. So you can't really mm -hmm. interconnected they system. Yes, they're definitely trying, though, because it seems like, and, and again, this brings me back to the bankers, right? Because we had the bankers running this whole show, right? The bankers and their intelligence agencies and their militaries for yeah. imposing these systems of control on all of us worldwide. They, they've gotten their claws into India as well. I mean, you know, through taking over the people at the top, people like Narendra Modi, right? Absolutely, that's definitely true. But I, Shill, so. I think that will not wipe out, though, the, um, the, the, the Indian race or the Indian people because they're just far too many, you know? I mean, that's the thing about India. I mean, the government has a hard time controlling the people. They're, so many. they're not listening. And, and the classic example is if a train is delayed in, um, you know, in, in London, Victoria, you know, people have this tight upper lip and it's like, oh, it happens all the time. And then you read articles, you know, in Britain about how this happens once in India and they just demolish the train station because they just had it, you know, <laughs> they just take it apart. Well, good luck trying to control those people. But controlling the British is very, very easy. And, and they are so fragile, you know, they live in this in many ways they're really fragile because they also they don't have the same survival skills as the russians and the indian people do they, they really just want if, if tesco is closed i mean that's it you know famine is going to wipe out absolutely everybody um they also live in, in high density okay that's true in india as well but i mean you know with nothing no agricultural sort mm. of supports around and then when you get into this um sort of because there is this eugenic uh, eugenics effect that keeps just coming back. And when you get into eugenics and you have reports about the heads of military intelligence being really into eugenics, and then they make their own people, you know, um, kind of marry, well, how deep are you into eugenics really? Because you're wiping yourselves out, my dears, you know? I mean, it doesn't make any sort of sense. And these people 
people literally are just too freaking stupid to, head, to tell their head from their rear side. That, that is my honest opinion. You know, so we have in the, in the military and so-called military intelligence, if you think back in the simplest terms, back at school, you had the sick kids who were really brutish but utterly stupid. And you know, if, if you just let them run around in a big gang, they could obliterate everybody. But they were stupid. Yeah. Actually, that's a brilliant analogy for the military, if you think about it. They're the, they're the bullies on the block. They've got the biggest weapons, right? And they've developed the weapons. They've spent ages. They've developed systems now. They've developed public relations. They've developed websites. And they have little brochures that you were talking about the other day for their conferences, projecting themselves as charming and well-mannered and genteel, right? Well-shaven. Those well-shaven psychopaths who are going out dropping the mother of all bombs on Afghanistan, you know, and arming ISIS to the hilt with, with the help of their good friends, the CIA, who have helped create ISIS and Al-Qaeda, right? So, and, and the thing that really gets me about the military is that hierarchy that you talked about. You started with that bicycle analogy, and I just want to hark back to it for one second because that's what it's built on. It's built on this old boys club hierarchy, I'm the general, I'm the major, tip your hat to me, wear a little extra flag on your uniform, and you know, call me sir, don't call him sir, or whatever they call each other, Mr. Lieutenant or Colonel, or you know, however they address each other. You have to use my title. And I just read a little <laughs> article in my inbox the other day, because you know, I'm actually subscribed to some of these DOD uh, websites, uh, just to keep tabs on what they're doing. So they sent out a little article <laughs> the other day, talking to their military, uh, you know, um, military, what are they called, officers or whoever, who are on the verge of leaving or retiring and going out into the civilian world, giving them advice on civilians don't respond very well when you say sir or ma'am. Try to call them by their names. Try to be normal. Try to fit in. And so on and so forth. <laughs> You know, so in other words, recognizing openly that these hierarchies are really, really stupid and really, really dumb in this day and age, you know, in America, for God's sake, you know, so, <laughs> um, but it's that ancient model that they are propagating time over time. And, how, and why? Because when they get the youngest ones into the military, they get the young boys and girls from high schools into the military they can sort of move them into this system of control and make them think that this is okay. This is the way we've done it for, well, not just 150 years, probably for all time, as long as militaries have existed. You know, we have this system and it works very well. It's called compartmentalization. It's called, you know, titleization. And it's called need to know. You'll, need, you'll know what you need to know and your commander will tell you what you need to know. And on the battlefield, you are mere, merely a tool. So they're creating tools. And that's what it is. It's a whole system of tool creation. So it's you, have to have a, you have to have obedience. You have to remember that the military is simply the organ. It's a government organ of violence. An organ of violence, no government would exist. Because we want to follow them. We want to do this, but they need these organs of violence to keep everybody in line. And they do it by keeping themselves in line. You know, you have to salute them, you have to salute them in a certain way. And mm -hmm. it's all, it's all, it, it's nonsense. If it didn't involve death, yeah, it would be so laughable that no one would even put up with it at all. But since it involves death, it makes it, 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 it puts it under the, uh, the heading of these horrible psychopathic mm -hmm. devils. Yeah, it's so. covered up though. It's covered up as a necessity. It's covered up as a need for our the defense of our nation. It's covered up under patriotism. It's covered up under national security. You know, and those are the lies. And the and the big old lie, the one that the, the public lie is to say thank you for your service to any person who says they're in the military. You know, and that's like a kind of a brainwashing kind of lie to keep the people in the state of the proper response to the military is to say thank you. Thank you for the violence. Thank you for, you know, taking our young boys and our young girls away from our normal societies. 
and moving them into the system of condoning and um, establishing violence in the world. It's a, it's a huge amount of euphemism going on in the military. And that's actually frightening when you look at what they are doing in terms of language, in terms of how they are exactly. um, you know, Very good. I, the masses. I want to interject one thing that happened this week that's the biggest atrocity in, in, in years and years and years. Trump just firebombed Raqqa this week, oh. and it hardly made the news. He bombed them with yeah. white phosphorus. Yeah. Now, if anybody's still on Trump's side and thinks, oh, Trump's trying to save us and the deep state's got him, you got to wake up to this. He dumped white phosphorus on 100,000 men and women, mostly women and children. Now, the way white phosphorus works is it burns your skin off. So that's how he killed 100,000 people this week. Hardly made the news. Hardly made the news. Yeah, I, I, I tweeted on that. I did see those tweets, and I just sort of retweeted when I saw them. White phosphorus is what they used in Gaza, what the Israelis used in Gaza. Right, they used it in Fallujah. Fallujah went out and they, they, caught, they, they grabbed a couple of contractors and they hung them up publicly to show that we're being resistant. So what did the U.S. do? White phosphorus all over Raqqa, or all over Fallujah. So that, it's so beyond a, uh, an atrocity that I can't even articulate it. So if anybody is listening to this and they're still thinking Trump is anything but one of those psychopathic demons we're talking about, you better wake up to what's going on. So that's, but anyway, yeah, it's the organs of violence. And so because it's compartmentalized and it's triangular, triangles, what that gives them the, the, their strength. What Catherine was doing was talking about one triangle to another, which is the same as the elliptical system that she and I talked about on several videos already. Uh, when you take down the triangle mm -hmm. and the secrets get loose, mm -hmm. and we start talking about um, working with one another and no secrets and all mm -hmm. that stuff, their power goes away. Mm -hmm. their, their power goes away. You can't have a military mm -hmm. uh, with, every, with everybody's equal. If somebody tells me to kill her, Right. Tell me why. Let's talk about it. You know, mm -hmm. you can't do a military like that. So, gets us out of a lot of stuff. Well, let me let me bring up. Anyway. Let me bring up one food for thought. One brief food for thought. The longer a society exists, the more it's involved in wars. You know, the more wars it it has conducted or been forced to defend itself against, the best and brightest and bravest um, men are usually the first to go to war to volunteer to uh, for the altruistic reason of saving their country protecting their families protecting their progeny and so the more wars you have the more of your best and brightest you kill off and they are not any longer bringing up families and instilling those values in them so society actually takes a turn for the worse with the more of the good people that you kill off so that is something to take into consideration. I mean, when you think about the hunters, they will go after the, the biggest buck with the greatest rack, you know, and then what they're doing is they're culling the herd genetically to have less and less robust genetics. So you eventually in your society get the kind of uh, the lesser quality people who go into the military for the wrong reason, because they are bullies, because they do like power. Uh, as opposed to the people who went in to make sure their country uh, could operate on a certain civilized level. I mean, in the last two, uh, last, uh, two terms of Obama, they were seeing consistently uh, officers in the Army, Navy, Marines being told to get out because they would not uh, swear a loath, uh, an oath of fealty to Obama mm -hmm. over the, uh, the Constitution. And what we saw when we saw that last was uh, Nazi Germany. 
because Hitler went to every single uh, general and uh, colonel and anybody of any power and said, you are going to swear a personal oath to me before Germany or in your country. And those people stayed and the people who would not, if just thrown out. So you, we've got a situation like that now. And I'm saying that coming from uh, an Air Force family. My father was a uh, colonel in the Air Force. He fought in Vietnam. I have my serious doubts about Vietnam being anything other than for money. So I think these people are being used and abused. But like I, like I said, you kill off your best and then you end up with an army that is highly questionable and highly impressionable as far as their taskmasters telling them we need war. So hmm, let's turn you against the actual population. And then they don't have that many qualms about it because they've been called out to a lesser uh, type of human being. Exactly. Vietnam was a moneymaker for them, but it was also gave them um, the Phoenix program, which is they were running MK Ultra and making mind control slaves at home, and they wanted to do the Phoenix program, which is the basically the program you guys are in. It's they they, they perfected the Phoenix program in uh, Vietnam, and now they brought it home. Mm -hmm. It's citizen torture. It's uh, uh, corrupting the entire society. Uh, 100 percent uh, panopticon surveillance. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another reason why you know they were bringing heroin back in the bodies of of my friends, yeah. my buddies, my my age. Yeah. You know, uh, it, 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 was a, it, was a, it was a horrible war for no reason to, to, uh, to make the bankers rich, which war always does, to perfect the Phoenix program and mm -hmm. to get this pipeline of heroin. Probably there are other nefarious reasons, probably child trafficking and all, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But anytime and there's a war, go ahead. I just wanted to interject that, you know, basically, in a sense, it's soldiers are being used, airmen are being used, Navy men are being used, you know. So this is what I was trying to say. You have these young kids being recruited out of high school and college, joining the ROTC program and joining the military, joining the Navy. And, you know, if you go to any of these museums and you see, for instance, if you go to, um, you know, in Washington, D.C., they have those, these NASA museums and they have all of these wonderful um you know, the spirit of St. Louis and all these other airplanes and they have these rocket ships and whatnot. They look fantastic, you know, and, and it must be so enticing for young men in particular, maybe women too, young women as well, to join the Air Force, for instance, and to have an opportunity to fly those deadly fighter planes. You know, they look very cool, those cockpits. And, you know, the fact that they fly at, what, 35,000 to 70,000 feet, they get to do such amazing things. It must be so seductive in many ways, you know, so I'm sure they get a kick out of an adrenaline in high out of a lot of this, this stuff that they're doing in the military and in the Air Force, you know, things that they think are not at all associated with death and destruction. So they get all of this experience in the military. They are they're very smart kids. They're great at, at science. You know, you've got to be like really good at physics and math, I think, to fly those planes, for instance. Uh, or to navigate those ships, possibly, in the Navy and so forth. You've got to be really smart. So you've got the best and the brightest being suctioned off and siphoned off into these armed services. And then their bodies and their brains are just used up. They're literally seen as government property. In fact, if you look at the, the, um, the history of military experimentation in this country, and this is the other side of it, obviously, that we are all experiencing today, you know, you can see that the, the military has, has no qualms about using up the people who have signed up. The military considers them their property currently, you know, and so they can um, shoot them up with vaccines, they can shoot them up with syphilis, remember the Tuskegee Airmen and so forth. They can do anything they want and get away with it by coming 50 years later and pretending to give an apology, you know, like the Clinton apology about the radiation victims and the, um, the Guatemala experiments and so forth. So they've created systems where they have literally given themselves power, I'm talking about the people in power, 
giving themselves power to use and abuse people who enter the system, you know, enter the services. So when I think about that, it makes me think, well, if these soldiers and airmen are so bright, can they see this? Can they see what we are seeing? Can they not understand what's going on? Can they begin to open up their minds and their eyes? And they, can they begin to realize how badly they're being used and abused? You know, because perhaps the change needs to come from them, from the ranks of the hundreds and thousands who join the armed for, uh, forces. Perhaps the change needs to come from them. Maybe they need to wake up a little bit and begin to leave the military in droves and begin to, you know, step and um, to uh, recognize and to put their own morality and their own sense of conscience out in the world and act on their own sense of conscience. You know? That's so, that's so great. You know, we, we talked, I think, Ramola, you and I talked about who's the victim here. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys, and the majority of the TIs that I've spoken to are on um, high developmental paths. They're rising up. They're searching. They're, and the more they search, the bigger they get, the more compassionate they get. They're on the way. And I know you guys go through hell every day, all night long, all day long, and it's not fun. But we talked about who's the vi real victim here, who's being uh, targeted. And it might be the perps. Mm -hmm. The perps are the ones that are, you know, most people, to go back to my consciousness development model, most people stay at the seven-year-old stage and the 12-year-old stage. 85% of the people stay in that range. It's very conforming, very, very left brain, very, most people stay in that. So, so if, we're, if, if this is a developmental um, exercise that everybody's going through, that, that can be most, tar most uh, affected by these demons, and they're not demons, they're devils. Uh, the biggest developmental gain they're going to get is by targeting these soldiers, by either locking them where they are or dropping them down. Honestly, if someone is in one of these low stages and they're sent to prison, they'll drop back down into the self-protective stage because they need it to survive. They keep people down. And another way to look at it is the chakra system. They keep people down in those lower chakras. They don't pull the heart chakra and down. That's where they stay all their lives. And so these, these people, these, these soldiers that have joined up and given themselves over to these devils, uh, are trapped down there. And it might be that, that the big trick is to try to get them to break out of this. And, and you're right, the talking to the people in the army, talking to the perps, realizing that they're the victims, that they're, they're the ones that are going to be savaged by the system. They're the ones that are kept down into this low level consciousness, unable to, to, to feel real compassion unable to really grow and open their minds. They're, they're being victimized. They're the real victim. They've consented to think? being held back, in a sense. You know, they've consented. They've acquiesced. They've consented to being held back as human beings, as com full and complete human beings, with a compassionate heart and, and an all-seeing mind that's willing to consider and examine for themselves. They've consented to giving over their minds and their thinking to somebody else, you know, to the people above them. Right. And we started in, a, in elementary school. The thing that uh, I've noticed, the characteristics, I've gone all the way through the system from uh, first grade all the way up. And in every level, they teach discipline mm -hmm. and obedience. I remember I did a, a paper in my doctoral program that was turned back because I confronted the system that I, I was in. And so on every level, they teach obedience. But it's a satanic system. Yeah, yeah. They, they built a system to teach obedience. Obedience is, is the trap. 
That's it, exactly. I think that I think you've hit the nail on the head there. That's what it is, because they are training all systems. I mean, you you know, not just the army. They're training school systems. They're training school kids to be obedient, to look up to authority, to not question, to not think critically, to not be independent, to not stand out, to not speak out. Well, this. Uh... I. I actually just want to interject on one thing because, um, you know, in all of this, to create disobedience, you have to start with utter, utter disrespect, with total disrespect. And I think the place where we need utter and total disrespect the most is the military because they are stupid. I'm sorry. I mean, you know, I understand that in the lower levels, they like to use people with high technical ability to bring them in is precisely to run the ships because at the top, they're too freaking stupid to do it themselves. But when we actually look at the top and what they can do, it's atrocious. If you go to a head of MI6, or MI5, I would expect some sort of military strategy sort of, you know, thinking. But when you see them or you hear reports about them screwing their own children, you think, have you not understood something here? I mean, you're not getting that there must be a foreign power utterly wetting themselves watching these videotapes of you actually you know, doing this to your own children, you morons. I mean, they did it. They did it one decade after the other. So no, it's actually not true that the heads are actually worth jack shit. They're not. They're morons. They're utter morons. The top qualification that they have is that they're either serial killers, psychopaths, or that they put their genitals into little children. That's the top qualification for somebody at MI6, I think, based on what I've heard. So if you really want to cycle out of the system, we have to look at these people and actually let them know how worthless they are and let them know in court and utterly asset strip them into the ground, everybody. And, you know, I want to start mm -hmm. with all these people who are worshipped. And actually, this cycles me back to um, why I got so angry about um, Karen mentioning, you know, uh, Robert Duncan. I mean, I had my run-ins with this man. I think he's a psychopath. I also think he's a Nazi based on how he talked to me. And I also think that the man has got the mental age of a seven-year-old because he's banging on about his fancy tech. Every single time I hear an interview with him, he's jeering at the victims. Oh, you can't. Oh, this can't be stopped. Oh, you know, it's too late. Oh, this tech's going to take over. And then he's talking some utter garbage. But, you know, when he's you know, saying, oh, I can't, I can't tell you how to shield yourself because that would be giving away secrets, he's not clever enough to think, hang on a second, my own country's being fucked right now with tech I worked on. Problem? Am I going to be next? No, this guy goes away and gloats on Facebook, apparently, that he put a brain chip into his head. Why well, think, donkey, you just put a back door, a CIA back door into your own brain, you moron. Is, is that good military strategy? You look at the people at the CIA, they're a bunch of idiots, and you give them access to your own brain? Are you kidding me? But this guy apparently did it. And then he's gloating about how he's got, oh, faster healing for a scar on his face. Well, that's totally beside the point. And, and saying, oh, I can't t tell you, victims of crimes against humanity, how to shield yourself, because that would be giving away you know, secrets, He's not taking into account what Karen said, which is a much more complex and much more intelligent point that you can't use classification to cover up crimes. Mm -hmm. That's end of story. Mm -hmm. He's a moron. The guy's a moron. And he's going on about this fancy tech and, oh, you know, all this wonderful stuff in the hive minds. But well, I'm sorry, if the hive minds were worth jack shit, we would be surrounded by geniuses. But we're not. And if we think about it for longer than a second, we realize, hang on, if the people at the top are psychopaths, they would never, ever want anybody around them to be enhanced in any way, because that would be competition. The last thing a psychopath wants is to dish out tech and develop tech that enhances people. I mean, oh, no, but, but, but you see, but you see, this is why they want a mind hive. They know they have no minds, you know, worth talking about. So they want to hive with everybody else. And this is the psychopathy at the very top. And this is what Omni was talking about in his electronic telepathy, cybernetic secret society that he was revealing. You know, so there is inside the military, inside the banks, there's like the bunch of these, you know, whoever they are, 5,000 to 8,000 people at the top, the same people that, be, that uh, Ronald Werner talks about. All of these guys are supposedly hive minded or, or inducted into the secret society where they have access to electronic telepathy. And they can 
sit around at a round table and hear each other's thoughts and, and poke in and listen to people's mind. They you should know, hear my thoughts from all that. I want to sit around <laughs> on those them tables, hey? I really <laughs> Trust me, they would love to get in your mind, my dear. They want to get in your mind. They want to get in your mind and they want to get in my mind because they think this is a way of controlling us. You see? And, and, and hiding us and pulling us in. And right now, who we are are the uncontrollables. They're, we're the ones they can't stop. You know, they must be watching this and, as you say, shitting themselves. <laughs> but they're not killing you. But they're not killing you, Ben. But they're not killing you. They've not killed us yet, Paul. Believe me, they've been trying. I can, I can actually give testimony in any court to that effect. For the last three weeks in particular, I've been hit intensely in my heart. I don't think they were giving me heart pain. I think they were trying to take me out, and I think they still are. I'm still sitting here, you know, with my shield at my heart because they're hitting me constantly. So there are some of us perhaps they'd like to take out. Maybe the talkiest and the ones they find the most obnoxious, like myself. <laughs> the others, you're right. They like to keep on a stick, you know, and toast us on the fire every now and then, turn us over. So we get a hit well, here, think, there, and everywhere. I think, they're, I think they're watching you to find out how close you get to the, the truth and how close you get to them. And oh. I think you guys are good. You guys are on a rocket ship to finding out. I think, I think together we are finding out and we are speaking out. And that, by the way, I wanted to bring this back to that point that you made earlier. It's about secrets. And it's about taking those secrets apart. And once the secrets are taken apart and exposed, that's when their power falls in the gutter. Right. You know? And right now, I can tell you, the last few days, ever since I published Millicent's article and then Omni's article with all of his revelations and his disclosure, you know, about synthetic telepathy and the CIA's AI. And, um, and also yesterday I published Arlene Johnson's note to all TI saying, please send out a demand to the government, send it to the Speaker of the House, ask them to ban electromagnetic weapons and so forth. So after I published all of that, I've been noticing, you know, because they do this on a regular basis, they engage in covert communications. I've been noticing all this leak symbolism around me. They're trying to give me some kind of message that I'm leaking state secrets. Well, I don't think I'm leaking anything. I'm just exposing everything. Right. There's a huge difference. Taurus. <laughs> I think you realizing have not a like secret, that. anything that you find outside. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's not a secret. It's what people tell me. And I'm, you know, just helping other people do to hear about it. That's all. Yes, right. yes, secret we can actually expose actually urgently. Now we'll be talking about because people have mentioned this that there are these eight thousand people hooked up or maybe even more to synthetic telepathy and, and the hive mind. I'm sorry, like communism was a hive hive sort oh, of yeah. activity and it took mm -hmm. quality down and there's a mathematical reason for that. And I'm telling you guys, you're not hooked up to the hive mind to make you cleverer because there's if there's eight thousand or more of you you're still a competition to those 11 who want to keep you down, you know, or three or however many, wherever you want to be in the, in the ranks. So no, you're hooked up to synthetic tele 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 to dumb you down. That's the only reason. Right. Yeah, I, I, I've never noticed any uh, studies on insects uh, evolving uh, developmentally at all. That's <laughs> So they want to hold you wherever you are. That's that's the whole idea. Listen, we have to uh, start winding it up. Why don't we just go along and say our last pieces and then we'll wrap up episode 13 of the Techno Crime Fighter Forum. Uh, who would like to start? Um, well, I'd, I'd, just like, sure, I'd just like to expand a little bit on what I started out earlier. If there's anybody from the military watching this and if you have half a brain left, I do advise you, please leave the military, get your friends, start thinking and talking about real men, like real men and re real women for a change. Start using your brain. Start recognizing that, you know, a lot hangs on you and that you are being used and abused and exploited. And you could do a lot better for yourself and for our country. Which, by the way, if you are helping to keep down TIs, if you are helping to keep secrets about electromagnetic warfare being waged on civilians today, you are actually in no way helping our country right now. The only way to help our country right now is to break the secrets wide open, break the hierarchies wide open, 
and start treating each other with respect as individuals. Right. Thank you. And if you're a perp, realize you're a victim. You're the victim. Yeah. Catherine? Yeah, so I think the military has to realize that they are part of the harvest nation that has been set up a long time ago. And if they look carefully, they will realize also that's also true of the, um, the Freemasons because they've been organized into this sort of um, very strict hierarchy. I say carefully at their symbols, they will realize that there's this huge amount of mockery going on um, about them. Absolutely total and utter mockery. And actually, before we finish, I know we're going to the end, but this is so important to, to, talk, to show you what I mean. Because there was this um, talk by, um, what was his name, Larry Clayman. And um, I would like to say that if I should briefly put it to the link, um, because he's giving this talk with the MI6 logo at the background, right? So mm -hmm. if you Google MI6 logo, um, well, maybe I can make this bigger. Um, if you Google MI6 logo, I can share my screen. One of this is the logo that um, that claim you made, right? And um, just look at it, just for a second, because it says it all about MI6. Now, Clayman gives his entire speech in front of the logo for the CIA, which is this little eagle thing, and then the other half is MI6, supposedly the MI6 logo. The only problem is that this isn't the MI6 logo at all. Um, what this is, I think it's either from the James Bond films or from the Austin Power films, but Austin Powers films, but it's the fake one. And what this does, it's using elements of the actual logo, which is the unicorn and the lion and the crown, but look at them, right? Their tails are intertwined to make a heart. So what this means, right, the male lion and, you know, this, with the horse you can't tell it's male or female, but this is a unicorn. Their tails are entwined to make a heart, as in, this is a gay organization. And then if you look carefully, the end looks like keys. So the key is that their tails are intertwined to form a heart. Now this, whoever made this logo is an absolute freaking genius because they also put in the crown, which is not the monarchy of um, Queen Elizabeth, it's the Crown Corporation. So this logo is actually a mockery of MI6 being in deep capture by militant gay guys and the Crown Corporation, also known as the Vatican or the, or the Mafia, right? Brilliant. But look at the lion, right? This this face of the light and when you look at the talk by um by Clayman, all you can see is the lion so frankly i i could never actually listen to the talk and know what he's saying because all i can see is that lion but that sort of stuff right it's absolutely brilliant because if you look at the original logo of um, mi6 what it is actually meant to look like that's an entirely different one there both the unicorn and the lion are mounting the actual general crest of the royal household right even that's a total mockery but this sort of um, the total degradation in the symbols goes throughout the entire military because the top have always been psychopaths and the top have always been laughing their heads up um, about the weaponized morons that they are running. That has mm. always been the case. You know? And when you, when you hear about so all of the things that we're talking about, the microwave weapons, the technology, also the chemtrails that they're fighting, the chemicals, nanobots, people are aiming for, full spectrum dominance but they don't say and i say what we're facing is the full spectrum dominance the factors so very very well said does, does military have two l's in english in the english one that's in american english oh i think in yeah, I think in English, English too. Yeah, it's just one L. Yeah. yeah it is a mockery. Karen, save All right. the best for last. <laughs> well, maybe. Um, like I said, I uh, my father was Air Force military. He served his country for 24 Karen, years. Karen, maybe you want to move um, your video a little bit. Can't said, quite see you fully. Pardon me? Your video is maybe too close or something. Can't quite see you fully. 
Okay, okay. Um, I was going to say, you know, I, I grew up with a father in the oh. Air Force. He retired as a uh, colonel in, from the Air Force. And I would like to say to the military people, and then have this also maybe heeded by our police, the one thing that you really do need to study, because you're studying all kinds of things, but the one thing you really do need to study is go back and look at the quotes and the writings of the founding fathers. All right. Lincoln, who is not a founding father, but President Lincoln said that at the point where a government uh, basically goes against its own people, and I think it's Lincoln, so I, I don't have the quotes with me right now, um, we have a right to change the people in the government or the government. And there are other quotes that tell you the individual in the Constitution is prime. It is everything about individual rights, not hive-minded uh, obedience, because that's why all of our ancestors came here from Europe to get away from hive-minded obedience and to put the individual first. Why do we put the individual first? Because if we are not trampling the rights of one solitary individual, then we will not be trampling the rights of a group of people, maybe a minority, maybe a majority. So you need to go back and verse yourself on what this country was founded on, the philosophy of it, and the conscience that comes with this unique uh, experiment in government. Because if you look at our ancestry, if you look at our heritage, you will understand that if you're dr being driven into a hive-minded, brainless obedience of authority, this is not American philosophy. You are adhering to foreign philosophy, which is something the Founding Fathers warned against. So you need to make sure that you are in your service to your country upholding the principles upon which this constitutional uh, republic was founded. It's not a democracy because if 51 people say we want to kill the other 49, that's not going to be allowed. Sorry, that's not blind democracy. What we have is a constitutional republic where the laws need to apply to every single person, whether he's self-proclaimed elite down to the poorest person on the street. You cannot do X, Y, Z to these people just because of their uh, social status. That is not American. If you have that in your mindset, you are not American. You need to go back and ask yourself, are you a patriot, fascist, and experimenting on other human hu human beings or bullying them or denying them equal protection under the law, Mr. Policeman, that is not American. That is not an American concept. So I would say instead of telling people to get out of the police or get out of the military, you go back and you study what it is that you're supposed to be and change it from within. You get group studies in your homes or you, or you band with like-minded people and maybe even, you know, have a lawsuit saying, you know, this is not constitutional for us to be sitting here with drones uh, hitting people as they drive along the highway who've done nothing in the world wrong to the country. So we do need people on the inside to change it from the inside because, frankly, if we abandon these things, then only the evil people will stay there. Only the evil people, the evil police will exist. Only the evil military will exist. And like I said, I come from an Air Force family. My father trying to do well for the country. And frankly, on the occasion he was given an order to do something that he himself disagreed with, he found a way to not do it. He found a way to do something else or skirt that or just plain stand up to the person saying that's not really legal. Okay. So at one point in time, I've told the story, he was given a handful of pills and his commanding officer said, I want you to take them and report back as to what their effects are during the next week. They, sir, and he said, it's none of your business, just take them and tell us what happens. All right, this is a man dedicated to his country and, and the, the Air Force. He went straight away and flushed them down the toilet and he came back and when his uh, commanding officer said, what kind of effect did they have on you? He said, none whatsoever, sir. Okay, there are ways to follow your conscience, okay? And uh, your country needs you to follow your conscience, okay? Our, our founding father said, the, our greatest strength is in our people. 
you know, knowing what is right and wrong and making sure that is what is preeminent. And that's what I'm asking you to do. An American is and see if you don't agree. That's what your life needs to to go toward and not just blind obedience. That is not American. Right, thank you. Wow. Thank you. That was great. Um, thank you very much, all of you, for uh, another thrilling Techno Crime Fighters Forum. I'd like to, before I get off, plug, uh, Mindy and I just published, uh, we're publishing a video of three parts, Dehumaniz Dehumanization and Devolution Through Torture, the Torture Agenda, uh, exposed, and we start with uh, the Inquisition, and we go through very quickly in the first two parts. The third part is going to contain this forum, the uh, what's happening to us today, and also what's going to happen to us in the future in terms of the panopticon reality through smart meters, uh, nanoparticles, uh, Elon Musk's, what is it called, the, uh, the, the global web, um, and how they're going to enslave all of us. So uh, if you've got a time, you can watch those two, those two videos. We've got the first two part up. Uh, we're working on the third one right now. We'll have it up sometime next week. So thank you very much for watching. It's been thrilling. And uh, have a great week.